Boker Tov and good morning. Thank you to our generous uh, sponsors of the series for the year, Dr. Zavi and Bella Morgan, who sponsored in memory of our beloved friend, Brian Galbit, Baruch Tzvi Ben Ruvay Nassan. They generously are sponsoring the year, but that does not preclude you from sponsoring on any given week. So feel free to speak to Linda or Lee or uh, anyone in the office and arrange your sponsorship. Just a housekeeping note, we are not at meeting the next two Wednesdays. Next week, my niece is getting married, Amir Tzashem. And the week after that, Rabbi Brody's daughter is getting married in Mitzvah Shem. So at least if we're not meeting, it should be for Simchas. So uh, we're not meeting for the next two weeks. You're welcome to meet on your own and continue our uh, Amun and Bitachon support group without me. But, uh, but I will not be here. Okay, we're starting a new Limud. We're going to start learning something new today. And we'll see how it goes, whether we continue. It's a very popular set of Sfarim that came out several years ago, one by one. Originally, it was printed anonymously under the name Bilvavi Mishkan Evne. Bilvavi, the Bilvavi series, Amar Amuna. Anyone ever hear of it? It's a very, very beautiful series, very powerful. I would learn the original books. I think it's up to volume. I don't even know what by now. An incredible number of volumes have come out, and the author is, uh, is now no longer anonymous and goes around speaking. Uh, they've translated much of it, including what we're going to learn, but we're going to learn it in the original Hebrew, which is the way it was intended to be learned and the way that learning should happen in our Lashon HaKodesh. So here he has a, um, a subset of his farm called Da Es Bitchonech, Know Your Bitachon. Because da, he has a whole set of farms, Know Yourself, Know Your Creator, Know, this is Know Your Bitachon. All right, so we'll see how it goes. Bitachon Bakadosh Baruch Hu Bitachon Atzmi. And here he's talking about the relationship between belief and trust in ourselves or belief and trust in others. Self-confidence, not in the best sense of the word, there is an illness where people lack self-confidence. It's bad to have no self-confidence, to have anxiety, insecurity, fear about one's own capacity or competency. That's an illness. So we need a healthy degree of self-confidence. It's very important to have self-confidence, to have self-love. Svasem famously says, Love your neighbor as yourself. The prerequisite within the mitzvah of loving your neighbor, Love your neighbor as you... So what's the assumption? That first there's a mitzvah too, love to love yourself. Now again, I always say, some people need to love themselves a little less. But many need to love themselves a little more. They don't love themselves, they don't believe in themselves, they don't trust themselves. So we're not talking about the healthy self-confidence, which is necessary to operate and to live. We're talking about an unhealthy, disproportionate self-confidence, where you think that everything is about you, and you are in control, and you can manipulate, and you can micromanage, and you are in charge of absolutely everything and everyone around you. And when you do, you are competing with the Almighty, with the one above. Because if you have too much trust and faith and confidence in yourself, you leave no room for Him. On the other hand, if you have too much trust and faith in Him, then you totally concede or forfeit or cop out when it comes to yourself. I won't go to work, I won't go to the doctor, I won't go to the gym, I won't go to anything in life. I'll just sit back and wait for it to happen and say, I have faith in Hashem. I have faith in Hashem. So let's start. Hadiyunim saviv hamusag bitachon mismakdim biyachas lekach sha'adam boteach ba kadosh baruch hu o lahavdil boteach ba'atzmo. This discussion, this uh, analysis, uh, revolves around this question that a person has a relationship with bitachon to trust and faith. It's either in Hashem or themselves. Ubekochos umarachos chitzonios, or with some external influence or power or source. I trust in my neighbor. I trust in my doctor. I trust in my lawyer. I trust in my mechanic. I trust in my stockbroker. I trust in the other. So one can either be trusting in themselves, trusting in God, or trusting in the other, and fill in the blank about what the other is. Most of the discussions about this arena, this area, revolve around the tension, the balance between the effort, the initiative we need to take, and conceding and turning to Hashem. To the degree that in many cases, the more a person has bitachon and trust in Hashem, the less effort and initiative they take. And that's a problem. That's a problem. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu invites us to be his partner. He wants us to take initiative. Meidach, on the other hand, Kasher Adam told us, Hatzlachasu b'shtaduso, Zeu bitur l'kach shu botech b'yichulaso, B'tchunosov hu botech b'atzmo. The problem is when you do the opposite. When you place the focus and the emphasis not on trusting Hashem, 
but on our own initiative, then you cut God out. You work excessively, you, you try excessively, you worry excessively, because you're botech be'atzmo. You are trusting in yourself. That expression, bitachon atzmi, means self-confidence. Nitpas kamala, it's quoted as an asset, it's a virtue. So the author of the Bavavi says that bitachon atzmi, self-confidence, which begins as a healthy virtue, if over-invested in and focused on, can actually become a vice. Overconfidence, too much self-confidence, is a major, is a major, major is a major problem. I think I quoted uh, Daniel Kahaneman a couple of months ago in a drusha who said that that was the problem. If he could change anything about the world today, it would be overconfidence. Overconfidence. <coughs> How many mistakes have happened in the world? Disasters of the world. Financial disasters, environmental disasters, interpersonal relationship disasters because of overconfidence. Overconfidence. People thinking they know too much or people thinking they're too capable, people thinking they're too in charge, and the overconfidence leads to disaster. And when asked what's one thing he would change in the world that would make it a better place, he said overconfidence. He would change a sense of overconfidence. We just had Daniel Kahneman, who's a Nobel Prize winning uh, economist? economist. So Rashi just had in the DAF a couple days ago, one of the many places that Rashi comments on something and says, I don't know. Rashi, the great commentator, without whom the Gemara, the Talmud, would be a closed book, Rashi had no hesitation to say, I don't know. But we live in a world where it's considered to be a deficiency. You're considered to have something wrong if you say, I don't know. You shouldn't say, I don't know. You have to know everything. It has to be at your fingertips. You have to be capable of everything. But to say, you know, I don't know. I really don't know. Either I don't know, I'm going to look into it, or on some of the very complicated, complex issues of the day, to say, I don't know. I don't know whether this peace plan is going to work, not work, is perfect, is imperfect. I don't know. I don't know what the policy should be about X, Y, or Z. I don't have a crystal ball and I can't see the future. But overconfidence is the kryptonite, which has caused many to sabotage their own happiness, success, uh, relationships, to sabotage their own lives. I'll tell you a, a story. Um, last week, two weeks ago, you and I were at a wedding south of us, 45 minute drive from here. And they were there with uh, a bunch of friends were there. And uh, one group of friends, one couple had left before us and texted Yocheved, there's crazy traffic on I-95, don't take it. I said, why would they not have put on Waze to go home? So she texted, did you use Waze? I said, no, no, we knew our way, we knew the way to get home. So we didn't use Waze. I said, when I leave Montoya Circle, I don't care if I'm going to Publix. If I'm leaving Montoya Circle, I go on Waze. Why? I know how to get to Publix. Doesn't mean I go, but I know how to get there if I needed to. I know how to go there. So why do I put on ways every time I go somewhere, even when I think I know how to go? I'll tell you why. First of all, it tells you where the police are, but I'll tell you why. Because I can only see what's right in front of me. So I can see as far down as a block, two blocks. Can't see around the corner. You can't see five blocks ahead. And you have no idea what's out there. There could be someone had an accident. There could be construction. There could be a stalled car. There could be uh, traffic. There could be an earthquake, which was felt in Miami. Mm -hmm. that caused a backup. Who knows what's happening more than two blocks ahead? So let's see. I think I know the way. So should I be overconfident and say, I'm going to drive the way I'm supposed to go because I know how to get there? Or should I say, you know, there's a satellite somewhere in the sky and it's able to see around the corner. And it's able to see not only five blocks ahead, it's able to see between me and my destination, and it's able to provide for me the authoritative, absolute best way to get there. So which one should I pursue? My limited, finite, very, <coughs> scope is very small. Uh, thank you, <coughs> I mean, bless you. <laughs> see, Ishtar Kagufa, I said thank you. You sneezed, they said bless you, I said thank you. It's mamish. Such a beautiful thing. Um, no? Okay. Put that, in, put that in an anniversary card one day. So, so what should you do? You're setting out to try to go somewhere. Should you go? You say, I know how to go. I don't need no ways. 
I don't need anyone telling me where to go. I don't need anyone telling me how to go. I know how to go. How many of us remember, either growing up, watching others, or being involved themselves, the fights that took place, especially in the New York area? Should you take the West Side Highway or the FDR Drive? Should you take the Lincoln Tunnel or the George Washington Bridge? Quick, quick, put on 1010 News, it's almost the 10s, and you'll hear the traffic, and then we're gonna go. And the one person in the passenger seat has a map spread out like this, and the other person's yelling at them, I told you we should take the George Washington Bridge, and now we're backed up, and we're gonna be late to the Lachaim of the Thanksgiving dinner. And the... How much Shalom bias was out the window before we had ways? Because everybody guessed which is the, I know the better way to go. Uh, there's always traffic this time of day, and you never trust me, and I'm always right. You always say that, but you're never right. I'm always right. How much fighting that went on. So today, Kodesh Baruch we live in blessed times, and we have on, on your phone. You push a button, put in the address, and now, Min HaShamayim, literally, literally Min HaShamayim, from the heaven, it tells you, no, 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 there's traffic there. You don't see it, because you're finite. You can only see what's in front of you. But I see that there's traffic, and there's an accident, and they rerouted, and there's a parade, and there's a stalled car, and there's a, you don't know it. But I know it, because I see. So how should we live our lives? with the limited amount that we can see, overconfident that we know how to get there? Or should we live our lives with the Rebona Shalom, who's our ways, who says, I see from the sky, and I see five steps ahead, and I know the absolute better way for you to go, and you should defer to me. I'm not deferring to you. So that's this tension between Ishtadus and Amun and Bitachon. Is it our initiative and overconfidence? I know how to get there in life. I know what to do. I know how to get there. I know how to bring about the results I want. Is that the overconfidence with which we should live? Or should we do our effort, we still have to drive the car, but defer in the direction to ways, to the satellite that sees Min HaShamayim from high up above. So before we talk about in what to invest our bitachon, our trust and faith, let's first define it. Let's first define it. What does it mean? What is it? Ma'u shora shakoach ba'adam shesamas miftacho be'etzem kol shehu. What is the root within us? What is the source within us that enables or allows us to put our trust or faith in anything? Halashon bitacho nigzer me'ashorish betach. Understand, by the way, that we are putting our trust and faith from the moment we wake up until we fall asleep. If you go to the store and you bought milk that you put in your coffee, you're trusting it's not poisoned. If you're crossing a street, you're trusting that the light is not broken and you're not about to get into a fatal direct accident. I'm, I don't mean to increase anyone's neuroses here by giving you these, I see the faces right now. Everyone's making an appointment with their therapist for this afternoon. I don't mean to make you more nervous. I'm just saying, it's just a reality. If you woke up this morning and you had the confidence to get out of bed, how'd you know the roof wasn't gonna cave in? How'd you know there was really a floor beneath you? How'd you know when you brushed your teeth that the water that came out of the faucets wasn't contaminated? How did you know, before your day even started, you put your trust in a million things. You put your trust in a good billion things before you ever even opened your eyes this morning. How did you know? So where is the shorish? What is the root that is within us that is enabling or allowing us to put our trust in anything, to be awake and to be alive and to be able to get out of bed in the morning? So Alashon bitachon nigzar me ashorish betach. The language of bitachon comes from the word betach. As ashorish betach matzana betor bapasuk, Rav Tzadok HaKohen tells us that if you want to understand the concept, if you want to understand what a word merely means, go to the first place in the Torah that it's ever used. And if you go to the first place in the Torah that it's ever used, you'll understand what it means. So this word betach, as the word betach is first used in the context of We all remember the story, the uh, first Me Too story in the Torah. Dina is captured, Dina is raped. She has two brothers who step up and stand out on her behalf. Shimon and Levi. How old are they at the time? Medrash tells us they're 13 years old. And from here we know what it, that's when you become a man because to become a man is to stand up for others. You can be 60 years old. And if you continue to allow others around you to be hurt, you're not a man. And 13 years old, if you step up and defend those who are defenseless, if you step up and help those who need protection, that's what it means to become an adult. That's what it means to be mature. That's what it means to be a a man. So Shimon and Levi, this is where we learn the age of Bar Mitzvah from, according to some opinions. Shimon and Levi step up to defend their sister Dina. How do they do it? They come up with a great scheme. Yaakov is not so happy with the scheme. Later in Parshas Vayechi, on his deathbed, when he gives the brachos, Yaakov criticizes their impetuousness, impulsiveness. He thinks they risked 
the Jewish people by doing this uh, really courageous move. In other words, what they did is not necessarily wrong. Yaakov just thought strategically it was the wrong way to go, even though in the end it proved to be successful. What did they do? Hamor, the son of Shechem, the son of Hamor, had raped Dina, and that was, I guess, in their culture, a way of expressing love. And he wanted to marry her. And uh, so Shimon and Levi said, "Yeah, that'd be beautiful. Let's integrate our people, our communities. That'd be wonderful." Oh, there's just one little detail. Before we can do that, we have this one requirement. It may not make so much sense to you. It's a little unusual. It's called circumcision. No anesthesia on adults. So we're going to need everyone, all the men, to get circumcised, and then we'll be able to exchange shidduch resumes, and we'll we'll figure the whole thing out. We'll take it from there. So, for love, what will a man not do? So Shem convinces the whole uh, people, the city of Shem. This is the origin of the city, the name of the city of Shem, to of course uh, get circumcised. And what was Shimon and Levi thinking all along? What was up their up their uh, sleeve? Was that the moment adult men circumcise themselves with no anesthesia, they're somewhat compromised. Their ability to fight is not exactly at its uh, top form. So, of course, they come and they take care of the whole city. I spoke about Monday in the afternoon, Kolel, in another context. Isn't that a form of collective punishment? Isn't that immoral and unethical? (coughs) What did everyone else in the city do? Shechem, Ben Chamor, raped Dina. But you had everyone else compromise themselves, and then you came and you wiped out all the men in the city? Isn't that a gross violation of collective punishment? I said that... uh, I have a good friend who says, we want to get back Hadar Golden's body and Oron Ben Herzl, just turn off the electricity to Gaza and tell them it doesn't go back on until we get the bodies. No electricity, no heat, no power, no lights, no nothing. Turn it off. All of Gaza, nothing until we get the bodies back. Now the problem is that the people in Gaza are so ruthless and cruel that they would let their own people suffer and die before that they would give back those bodies. So my friend would say, good, let it happen. Let them stay there until we get it back. I, right, what about collective punishment? What are the morals and ethics of collective punishment? So there's a big discussion about this, which we're not going to get into for now. But in that context, Shimon and Levi, if you think about it, every war is a form, that's the Maral answers. Maral says every war is collective punishment. Every time you bomb a city, you bomb an enemy, and there's civilian casualties, it's a collective punishment of the civilian casualties, but that's, that's war. That's war. So there are different rules of murder in the context of life and in the context of war. In life, if I aim a gun at someone else and shoot them, I'm a murderer. It's a capital crime. In a war, if I aim a gun at an enemy and shoot them, I'm a hero. I get a medal and a star. It's the same act. Why in one am I a murderer or a capital crime, and the other I'm a hero, I get a medal? Because war is a different context. And that's what the Maral says. Collected. So when, when Shechem ben Hamor raped Dina, it was a declaration of war. And in a declaration of war, there's no such thing as collective punishment. That's how the Maral answers. Now you can sleep at night. So Shimon and Levi come to the city. And it says, how did they come to the city? They came to the city. The key word for us is? Betach. They came to the city Betach. What does that mean? <coughs> and they killed all the men. When did they come to wipe them out? On specifically the third day. The third day after surgery is when we're the most vulnerable, is when we are the worst. So what does it mean they came betach? Betach meant a sure bet. Betach meant there was no opposition, no adversary, no chance of losing. It was a sure thing, betach. Why was it a sure thing? Because they had absolutely rigged the system. They had rigged the game. They had absolutely rigged the game. It wasn't a fair fight. To begin with, the other side had zero chance whatsoever. You know, like if you're the Patriots or Red Sox, just rig the game so the other side has no chance whatso... No? Has no chance whatsoever. Okay, we'll just leave it at that. So that's what it means, that's what it means, betach. Matzav zeh mugdar batora bo ir betach. So now we've defined what betach, what bitachon is. What does it mean when they came to the city Betach? They came entirely confident. Not overconfident in themselves, but confident in the plan, the result. Confident in the outcome. Confident it would work out for the best, it would work out favorably. Confident it would work out in a way that Hashem wanted. Ach <laughs> Ha 
It's such a beautiful insight he has. What is bitachon then? What does it mean to live with a sense of bitachon? It means to live with surety, with confidence. It means to live knowing that what is meant to be is what's going to happen. That's what bitachon means. Betach means knowing, with no anxiety, no worry, no fear. No concern, no doubt, no uncertainty. It means knowing, absolute, knowing with certainty that what's meant to be will be. That the outcome that's intended is what's going to happen. To live life, betach, with a sense of bitachon. The system is rigged in our lives. You know how it's rigged? Not by us. The system is rigged. If we are close with Hashem, then he says, you can have betach, you can have confidence and surety, you can know with certainty that what's going to happen is what's meant to be. That there's no room, that you have no, nothing to fear whatsoever. That's what betach means. That's what it means. So now that we've defined our term, now we can explain how it applies in our lives. Shnei shitos b'yachas lamidas habitachon. Hachazanish besifra emun habitachon. Is that what we're up to? Did I just skip? That's what we're up to. The Chazanish in the Sefer Amun Abitachon, which we learned together many moons ago, the Chazanish says there are two fundamental opinions about what Bitachon is. Shitas Balachovas Alavavas, Adam Botech Shirak Mashakadish Baruch Hu Gazar, Hushi is Kayim, and Shitas Rabbeinu Yona, Adam Botech Shakadish Baruch Hu Yafik Lo Esritzono, O Yisapek Lo Estrachav. So the Chavos Halavavos says that Bitochan is a person knows that if it was decreed upon him by Hashem that something good is going to happen. And that it will happen and if something bad it won't happen because everything is good. Chazanish says Bitochan is not that Hashem will bring the outcome I want but that whatever outcome he brings is what's meant to be. Many people misunderstand Bitochan. We learn this in the Chazanish. They say, I have faith that the Shidduch is going to work out. I have faith that they're going to have a full recovery. I have faith that the stock market's going to come back. I have faith that the deal's going to get done. I have faith in Hashem that whatever I want is what He's going to do. Says the Chazanish, that is a counterfeit. That's not real trust and faith in Hashem. That's faith and trust in yourself, and that's a hope and a wish that He's going to bring about the result that you think is best and right for you. But that's not bitachon. Bitachon is, I have trust and faith that even though I think this is what's best for me, and even though from my perspective this is the outcome that I want, I have trust and faith in Hashem that whatever will be in the end is what's right for me. That whatever will happen is the best for myself, is the best for me. Now, that's very, very, very hard to do in life. I don't mean to minimize or suggest that that's something easy. That is something which is very, very, very hard. It's easy if you didn't get that job and then a week later you got a different job and you look back in life and you say, you see, I thought that was terrible. I cried my heart out. I didn't get the job I wanted. Hashem had bigger plans and you see, it always worked. That's easy then. But God forbid a person loses a loved one in life, gets a terminal diagnosis, has a catastrophic incident, it is much, much, much harder to say that I trust, I have bitachon, that this is what's best for me. If it's hard for us to do, the, the strategy that I always say that we should follow to do it is to find the people who are the most affected and grab onto them. A Holocaust survivor who still has trust and faith in Hashem. And we may be the last generation, we are the last generation, who will be able to latch on to them and grab their coattails and ride their wave. But you find the Holocaust survivor, it, it, there's, I don't think anyone in history who lost and suffered as much as any Holocaust survivor. Any particular one. We live our lives. Somebody had a tragedy in their life. They lost one loved one. Their world is upside down, and rightly so. We, we, our heart goes out. We can't imagine. It's incomprehensible, that sense of loss. And then you look at a Holocaust survivor. They say, yeah, I lost my parents, all my siblings, my spouse, my children, every cousin. I lost the entire world I knew. There, there's nothing to even talk about. And yet so many have a smile and a skip in their step. Some are skipping their step with their walker now, but still a skip in their step. And, and they walk around with a faith and a hope and an optimism in Hashem and in fellow man. And so what I say is, grab onto them. Even we sit here and we struggle. We say, well, I don't know. And how could it be? And where is he? So you say, just, just grab onto them. Just grab onto them. You know, if you're not supposed to, you don't have your own Wi-Fi, so just grab onto someone else's Wi-Fi. They have a connection above and you have no connection. You're getting no connection right now. Use them as your hotspot. Holocaust survivor hotspots. 
That's a good article. Holocaust survivor hotspots. Use the Holocaust survivor as your hotspot and say to them, can you, you know, my kids don't have s- smartphones, but if they have a device, every car ride, mommy, Abba, can you make me a hotspot? Put me on a hotspot. Make me a hotspot. Put me on a hotspot. It means I can't connect, but can you let me connect through you? A hotspot, a hotspot is when you turn your phone into like a Wi-Fi connection for someone else. So you're, through your phone, now they're connected to the, to the internet and you could say goodbye to them because they're no longer connected to you. <laughs> so sometimes you're the one saying to them, let me turn on a hotspot for you. <laughs> sometimes you're the one telling them that in the backseat. Let me put on a hotspot for you. So that's a great image. Holocaust survivor hotspot is that even when you're struggling to connect, you could find someone else who's super connected and who's gone through much worse and, and let them be your hotspot so that you can connect, so you can connect through them. So Bitochon, the Chavaz Alavavah says, is not saying, Hashem, I have Bitochon, I have trust that you're going to make the outcome what I want. It's I have trust that whatever the outcome will be, it is what's best for me. It is what's best for me. Painful things happen to good people. Bad things don't happen to good people. And there's a fundamental difference between painful and bad. Good and bad are judgments, they're labels that we're not entitled and we don't have license to ascribe. How do we know what's good from bad? We, again, come back to my ways analogy. We have very limited vision. We only see what's right in front of us. So how do we know what's good and what's bad in the long run? What's good and what's bad, not only for ourselves and for our generation, but for generations to come. Good and bad, only the infinite can know. We know but painful and pleasure, that we know. So it's accurate to say painful things happen to good people. And pleasurable things happen to bad people. But whether good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people, we can't know. So that simple paradigm shift, not from bad things happen to good people, but painful things happen to good people, enables us to see it differently. So the Chavaz HaVavaz defines Bitachon as, not Hashem will conform to what we want, but I have trust and faith that whatever will be is what's meant to be. It's not bad it's by definition good, and even if it's painful for me, that doesn't mean it's not, be- it's not good. Almost every medical procedure is good, even though it's painful. It can be painful and good, those are not opposites. It can be painful and still be good. A person has to uproot themselves and travel to a faraway place, and he has to put together some money to do it. So according to means, I have faith that Hashem is going to give me all of the tools I need in order to get to my destination, to my aim. So the Chavaz HaVavaz says, I, I intend to go there, but I have trust in Hashem that if it's, to be, if it's meant to be as I get there, I'll get there. And if it's meant to be as I don't get there, I won't get there. And whether I get there or not, that's up to Hashem. I'm going to try. That's how the Chavaz HaVavaz understands it, as opposed to the Rabbeinu Yonah. But let's get back to our topic. Beperek zenin asela amod al shorosh koach habitachon, so let's start. To get to the city Betach. The confidence that we have that we can get done, what we feel we need to get done, is to know that there's nothing standing opposite us. There is no tension, there's no friction, there's no adversary. That can stop us. We have a sure and certain knowledge that we're going to succeed, that we're going to triumph. So bitachon at its root, at its core, is the confidence we can have that nothing can get in our way. Now, why should we have that confidence? In whom is that confidence? What is the nothing can get in our way? That we still have to define. But at the core, if you're trying to get to the root of what betach, of what bitachon is, it's to know that there's nothing that can oppose us. There's nothing that can stop us. There's nothing that can get in the way of what is meant, of what is meant to be. Nefesh ha'adam or keves bofen klali mishnei rivadim. Pnimi 
v'chitzayon. The soul of a person is made up of, of two parts, our inner world and our outer world, external world. So there are two perspectives that we can have. And the, the internal, which is broken and which is compromised and which is held back, and the, and the external. I'm sorry, the opposite, right? The external, which is separate, and the perspective is broken, and it is in parts, and it's not clear, as opposed to the internal, which is entirely unified and one, which is pure and perfect, which is whole and naki, and is, and is, absolutely, uh, and is absolutely clear. Nefesh Adam, sorry, Akenim, Navola Chapez Betor Olam, Hashafel Ba'an Nisunim. If we look at this world, this broken world in which we find ourselves, in which we find ourselves. So it comes out as the following. If we look at the outer world, if we look at the world through our outer selves, then all we see is opposition. And all we see are challenges. And all we see are places and things where it could go wrong. Everything can go wrong. The car is going to break down. The person is going to break up with me. The deal is going to fall through. Our health is going to is going to fall apart. The thing is going to. All you see around us is brokenness and potential for things to go wrong. All you see around us are adversaries and opposition from what we really want and what we want to have happen. So the world is a very dangerous place. There are fights and wars and battles. The physical world is made up of different parts. <laughs> The world is filled with free will, with choice. It's a world that's filled with wars and battles. Every moment that you're alive is a moment you're battling. You're battling not to eat the fattening food. You're battling not to say the wrong thing. You're battling to get through the end of the day. You're battling for whatever. Everyone has their own battle. Every moment that we are awake and alive, we are here to fight we are here to battle. We are here to triumph. Sometimes it's huge. And sometimes it's negligible. There are some very difficult wars and battles. And there are some things that are small and, and insignificant. And some things that are small and insignificant. So sometimes your Wi-Fi is down and you got to call Xfinity for the 4,000th time that day. And that's a small battle. Now, Xfinity, anytime you have to call Comcast, that's like, that's like taking on Iran. So when you look from the external perspective, you wake up in the morning and you think about all these external forces that are operating in your world. Other people, other companies, other traffic, other technology, other weather. If you look at the other, then the world is filled with opposition, adversary, challenge, uncertainty, doubt, fear, anxiety, worry. And even when it appears to you that you have a moment of quiet, If you feel you have a moment of serenity, tranquility, or quiet, you're probably in your most vulnerable state. That's when you can really get walloped in the head by the thing that you're not anticipating or thinking about or protecting yourself from. That's a pretty sad, pessimistic description of life. The good news is that's the one he's going to reject. Right? So if we live with this external sense of self, we live with the, all the forces that are around us and we see ourselves as the one who has to confront all those things, then we'll, we, we will see ourselves and see our lives as being in a constant state of battle. And in that constant state of having to battle, you can have betach, you can have bitachon in absolutely nothing. Because again, we define betach as confidence, surety, absolute knowledge that it's going to work out. But if your perspective of the world is from your external sense of self 
and the forces that you're going to have to confront, then you can have betach in nothing. There's nothing you can be sure about anymore other than death and taxes. Isn't that the expression? There's nothing to be sure in. You have no knowledge of anything today. Every day we wake up, it could be an entirely different world. We have no idea what the world will look like. Our personal world or the world around us, it changes on a dime. And if we live life with our external perspective, then you can have betach in nothing. And that's a pretty scary place. It's a pretty way, a scary way to live. It's really debilitating and it's really depressing. However, and he says, his, his, You can have no surety that you're going to overcome and triumph. In this world, there's nothing that you know will last. There's nothing that you know is here to stay. There's nothing that you can be confident is permanent. Even the nations and the empires and the armies. For every force, there is an equal and opposite force. I think that's one of the rules of thermodynamics. For every force, there's an equal and opposite force. So you made your coffee hot, but nature is trying to make it cold. You're trying to keep the food, your leftovers to last a little longer, and nature is trying to make them turn stale and moldy. You're trying to stay young, Botox and plastic surgery, and, Kosh Baruch Hu says, too bad. The way that people are created is you're going to look old, so lean in and embrace it, because you're not fooling anyone anyway. So the world around us, everything that we're trying to make Everything that we're trying to make permanent, I want to look young forever. It ain't going to happen. For every force, there's an equal and opposite force. So, so far we've just set up the negative. Next, in two, in three weeks, we will pick up. It's a long time to go. Listen, the preview I'll give you, but the preview, we've been learning long enough for you to know what the preview is. The preview is that the more that you're in touch with your neshama, your inner voice, and your neshama is attached to the Ribbonah Shalom from which it comes, the more that you will know as you live life with betach that absolutely everything is permanent. What is permanent that's reliable that you can count on with knowledge and comfort and surety is that Hashem is the one in charge and that whatever happens is what's meant to be. So when you knock him out of the equation, when you're in touch with your outer voice, your outer sense of self, so then you can't have confidence in anything. And you can't know anything permanently. And you can't stop any adversary or opponent from defeating you. But if you turn to your inner voice, to your neshama, the more you listen to your neshama, the more you're in conversation with your neshama, the more your neshama is attached to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, from which the neshama comes, then the more it's plugged in to know that everything that happens with betach, you know that the game is rigged. You have the winning numbers before they even start the game. You've got the winning hand before the cards are even dealt because the dealer is, is you. You're in with the dealer. So how do we live our lives? With our inner voice or our outer voice? Listening to our neshama or listening to our body? Are we listening to our soul, which knows with confidence and knowledge that everything Hashem does is by design, that it will work out by definition, that good things happen to good people, even if they're painful, but they're good? Is it the neshama that we're listening to? Or does our neshama get outshouted? Is the neshama's volume turned down because the body is filled with some tension and sweat and anxiety and worry because we're a physical beings operating in the physical world? So who are we at our core? Are we the body that has a soul or the soul that has a body? What is designing our perspective on the universe, let alone our perspective on our day? Is it our external sense of self or is it our internal sense of self? So again, and we'll get to, if you have a choice between the two, this is exactly the paradigm I began with. I could either say, well, I know how to get back to Boca, so why bother going on ways and then sit on 95 traffic at 10 o'clock at night when you're desperate to get home and go to sleep? Or you could plug into ways, plug into a Kodesh Baruch and say, I'm along for the ride. Tell me where we're going. Just tell me where we're going because you know much better than I do how to get there. Which one are we going to listen to? Have a great two weeks.